What I wanted to talk about was uh, Daniel Ingram. I'm surprised I've never spoken about him before. I was looking at Kula Das, uh, uh, the interview, and I noticed that uh, Daniel did a, an interview recently. I'm totally out of it here. I spend all my days studying not uh, and, and avoiding the social media, certainly the spiritual social media. It's absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> And I find out that Daniel's actually having to defend himself again, again from a from someone who I wouldn't even take serious anyways. Someone who his arguments don't hold any weight, and he even mentions it in this interview that uh, you know these are for uh, people who don't actually are not certainly not scholars, certainly not somebody who will uh, you know check the references and and really uh, think about them, right? that someone who's just copy pasta, copy pasta. Right? And that's what I want to talk about here. So, I mean, I'm not going to go in. If there's an interest, I'll go into it a little further. But Daniel Ingram is um, he's known uh, have his, having written a book called Mastering um, the Core Teachings of the Buddha. He's on his second edition. It just came out. So I'm actually going to read it. What I'm going to talk about quickly is just who he is and what this critique is all about and... It's kind of funny, actually, uh, because the comment section of this particular podcast uh, is absolutely telling of what we're living through right now. So, long story short, Daniel Ingram is an emergency room doctor who is um, supposedly a long-term practitioner of Buddhist meditation. He learned one style, supposedly Tibetan-influenced, and then Theravadan, neither here nor there. He's kind of applied some meditation maps, um to his experience, and he's tried to share that. Uh, what the current problem is, is they're critiquing him because he's actually working with medical science to try to implement some of these meditation maps uh, to try to help people. And I mean, especially nowadays, today, with just recently 41% of people surveyed said they were having a problem with anxiety or depressive episodes. That's, that's three and four times higher than it normally would. Uh, so it is an absolute crisis. I've been talking about this for a couple of years. That the next crisis would be, um, would be this this idea of uh, this whole uh, health idea. But neither here nor there. Danny wrote this book. Um, it's a little bit uh, at the time. The first edition was a little bit. Um, how can I put this? Controversial uh, because. It wasn't specifically what he put in the book, more so his strong attachment to Kasina meditation. Now that comes from the Vasudha Muga. I've talked about Kasina. I personally don't think it is what he characterizes it as. Uh, and there's the first critique that no one ever talks about, again, because we're not dealing with, with, I think, because we're not dealing with scholars. So they, you could certainly critique this gentleman on the fact that he uses Kasina meditation uh, for pleasure. He regularly we'll talk about how he will use casino and oh i get these enjoyable uh, hallucinations and these colors and lights and you know they sit around and they're having a good time right and the person he wrote the book with is exactly the same they're supposed to be long-term practitioners but they treat this like you know it's a game and don't misunderstand I understand it 100%, but what I'm getting at is that is a critique that could be given. That could be an example of not having conquered the self when they're indulging or not having conquered the kama chando, this sensual attachment, this uh, desirous attachment to uh, the senses. Um, right? So that was the initial critique. He seemed really heavy on this casino and, you know, he had some, some weird views, but he didn't really out and out talk about him. He did talk about idi, siddhi, these extraordinary powers, these special powers. Um, but the book itself didn't go into it in great detail, but it was him personally talking about uh, again, another critique, which would be easy to level against him is the fact that he has this attachment and even um, a want, a desire to achieve these um, special powers. But again, don't misunderstand. I understand uh, what it could be. It could simply be um, working towards uh, those places on the map, right? So if you achieve a cessation of the self, 
then you, according to the map, will possibly achieve some, some supernormal powers. Right? Which makes sense, right? If you're not all tied up and it's about me, then I've always talked about it as extraordinary powers in the sense of concentration or even being able to listen because you're not, uh, you know, held back by so much ridiculousness. But again, so he wrote this book talking about how the maps weren't um, uh, clearly put out and, you know, and, and he was critiqued for a couple of big things. And this is what I'm going to get to this recent letter is part of the critique. One, he talks about these negative experiences. And this is why I went to Daniel initially. Because I was experiencing the same idea of anger and animosity that I would carry with me. And yet I had come off of 20 years of Brahma uh, Chitta, Brahma Vihara practice. So, I mean, right? compassion and loving kindness applied to all, um, all sentient beings. Yet here I'm feeling anxious and angry animosity and fear and all these weird emotions and so this letter was just put out by um, um, this gentleman I think his name is Anileo I don't really pay attention to some of these gentlemen because they just spend their days they like they like hearing themselves talk I don't know if you're familiar with these gentlemen and ladies obviously but I apologize I'm, ugh, I don't use pronouns and all that jazz the way I do not intended to hurt anybody's feelings it's just because I it's not something that even crosses my mind. I mean, the idea of um, people who think about getting ripped off or stealing things, it's the people who would consider ripping people off or stealing things. That's the way I, but I may be wrong on that. Uh, but I don't like uh, these individuals who, when they could get their point across in a half dozen words, they'll use 14 or 15 words that you know they went to the dictionary to find. And they're just publishing to publish, right? They're just rewording things. I've seen that over and over again where, wait a minute, and then you go and look, and yeah, they literally just reworded the title and rewrote the text and republished it. It's the same piece. They just retitled it, and they get a different, it's so that, oh, look at me, I'm published with 15 articles. It's ridiculous. Again, same idea I've talked about. Um, the message is what matters, Uh but we're confused by unnecessary and ridiculous things. So my issue recently was I've spent the last, what, couple months doing some studies, and a big part of that was um, the mind illuminated. And again, I don't really give a rat's butt about uh, Kula Dasa, John Yates, um, as an author at the time, right? Didn't even pay attention to the gentleman. I, I think partially proves... My point that what I was paying attention to was the content in the book because, again, it was pretty clear. And as I mentioned, it seems to me it's pretty clear that he, all he did in the book was share what he was taught. And this limited experience is shown by the fact that it's never really developed since and then everything that's come out, the drama that's come out since, right? Not so much the fact that he had an open relationship, as I said, it is wholly to do with his reaction and how he's handling it since. So let's talk about reaction and how they handle it. So here we have a lot of people probably uh, wondering, right? Because Daniel just had an article published saying that it's, he's, it's, he's absolutely dangerous for two big reasons. One, he's trying to share this uh, map that is not wholly Theravada, and so it's, it's, it's wrong and dangerous. Uh, this map of knowledge, of awareness, of absorption, meditative absorption or healing, understanding. And secondly, that he talks too much about fear and these negative emotions that come up on this path. Now, I'm in a number of courses with supposed um, advanced practitioners. I say supposed because not a lot of them, not a lot of them, but sorry, not all of them are. Uh, some of them are actually fairly new. Some of them say they're long-term practitioners, but they're not. Um, but the ones that are, when we talk about this, they absolutely agree that it's not all wine and roses, that the practice itself includes a lot of negative things. Think about it, insight. When you really start to think of some of the horrible things that you've done in your life or that's been done to you, I mean, that's traumatic. And as I've talked about before, mindfulness-based stress reduction doesn't work because they don't bring in the impermanence. Um, 
and emptiness and dependent origination. That's the same thing uh, from Buddhism. So when you're challenging your anxieties, right, which is the same idea as insight, when you're challenging your anxieties and you don't realize their dependent nature, meaning they come from this or that, like the example I gave when um, a well-known Theravon Vipassana uh, practitioner and making millions, I'm sure, at this. And someone asks about feelings of uh, revenge in a divorce. It doesn't matter that this gentleman does have experience um, in dependent origination and emptiness and an understanding of this. It's in the Theravain, strictly. I mean, when you talk about revenge feelings, it's simply, hey, you know, those are based on your jealousy and your feelings of what you were hoping for, right? These um, future hopes and dreams that you had that have been dashed, right? But instead, the recommendation was, well, I like to take those sorts of feelings on long-term retreats and make room to compost those. Are absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Not helping anyone. And here we are again, a Theravadan monk who's supposed to be dedicated to the uh, liberation of all sentient beings. Well, arguably, they're, li they're dedicated to liberating themselves alone, so I don't know why we'd even listen to their opinions, being as selfish as they are, but neither here nor there. A little bit of a joke, but... Here he is saying that it's dangerous to teach people meditation. It's dangerous to teach people about the fear and, and some of these negative emotions that might come up in meditation. That, to me, as a long-term practitioner, right away, I'm like, dude, I'm not listening to you ever because that's why I came to Daniel in the first place. I'd been practicing for a very long time. And yet... Uh, And yet, um, that's what they critique him for. It's, it's ridiculous to me. I came to Daniel because there is so much fear and anxiety that can come up in this and how to deal with it. And it's just a natural, um, it's natural on the stage. And he's not wrong. Other teachers do mention it. They just don't mention it as much. Right. So let's go on to the critique. So we covered that. One, he, they saying that what he's teaching is wrong and it's not going to help people. I argue they're wrong. Absolutely. Science has proven, you know, it's working. And for me, I don't agree with everything he says. But again, it's a personal journey. So I can't really critique. But let's talk about what the critiques are in these uh, in the comment section. So they break down to a few different. In fact, there's one really long. Oh, wow. Well, comments have uh, I reloaded the page. So there's quite a few more comments since. Jake. So one guy went on, and uh, he wasn't wrong. Let me just try to find this here. He went on and on and on about uh, his critique. Um, he had me at first. Uh, but then he went on and went a little bit ridiculous. Wow, yeah, there's a bunch of people. Oh, it looks like the one guy deleted his comment. I should have copied it. I guess he was getting a bunch of hate. But he was, for the most part, wrong. I can't even remember exactly. Oh, here we go. No, he didn't. So he says, uh, Daniel's delusional. Um, he delves into paranormal with magic and fairies. Daniel warns, beware of fairies. Okay. He's not wrong uh, in the critique of the paranormal. If you were going to critique him about being able to fly or walk through walls, I'd be with you. But when we're talking about magic and his idea of magic and fairies, all I have to say is, have you read the Bardo Thedul lately, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, where it talks about these, these visions? So um, he talks about claims that aren't vetted. I mean, who is there to vet, right? Who, who's to vet? Right. If if no one's going to admit, I don't really care about that. I don't even care that he's talking about the Arhat. Like I said, in here's this another critique. 
who didn't even watch or listen to the podcast because there's a timestamp where he talks about, I argue, he's trolling these people. The next critique is he uh, claims he had authorization to teach from a particular guy and he was only on a short retreat with, I don't care. I mean, I see how many people who claim they have lineage and it's from somebody who claimed to have the lineage or, I mean, look at some of these people who, I mean, there's worse examples of people who claim to have lineage. They, they didn't even meet the person that has given them the lineage. So I just ignore that. Next critique is he was talking about a green, mushy, demon-like uh, creatures. Well, again, have you read the, uh, the uh, Bardo the Duel? And he goes on and he says it's a textbook, textbook of illusion. He says, uh, is there any difference between green, mushy demons and fully enlightened Buddhas? Um, there isn't. Dude, everything is illusion. And that's what equanimity is about. There is no difference. Y yeah, that's Buddhism. And he goes on and he says he makes Deepak Chokra's uh, quantum healing. Dude. The total difference between someone who's given this for free and trying to help people and giving of his time so that science can start implementing this stuff, medical science, versus a guy who just wants to charge thousands of dollars to blow smoke up your butt. Yeah, big difference. And he, uh, let's see here, he says, isolated inch, let's play a game. I'll give you a Daniel Dreamer experience, and he didn't finish this. It would have been fun if it was Daniel Dreamer experience, but he didn't finish it. He says, uh, insight knowledge Daniel obtained. A dream of which zapping things with her wand. Well, I mean, think about it. How, how do we not all dream weird things? Um, and I don't know specifically how he's critiquing this because, never mind. A dream of a gerbil on a wheel and seeing God. <laughs> this guy has no creativity because I love that. A gerbil on a wheel, seeing God. That's exactly what we all are. We're just gerbils on a wheel here, dude. I mean, it's a great example. And the third, he says, being on a hike, legs tired, shoulders hunched. I don't even know what that means. Like, <laughs> come on, dude. Try to stay on the page here. And he says he's an MD. He's obviously educated. He writes a book readable enough. He delves into meditation maps and stages with technical fury, yet he gives the most juvenile responses to his insight experiences. As soon as I read that, I'm like, what? What are the juvenile responses? You saw a witch. That's he's, he's picking one. And I mean, how many of us haven't had these weird little hallucinations and thoughts? I mean, everything's a hallucination. Little green men, well, again, Bartle the Duel is full of them, and a lot of people worship that. Fairies, it's an individual... I mean, it, it were explained in uh, Tantric uh, Buddhism that these emanations are from within. They're your own productions. So if you're making fun of this weirdness, wait till you see what you're going to see. Because it's going to scare you and it's going to shock you and it's going to make you laugh. And it, it's weird. It's weird that these people don't understand what this, uh, this is all about. So the big one here is he says, uh, and this was the critique of Analeo. This was the critique in the podcast. It was a critique in a number of times in the chat. And yet, he's so wrong. He says, no joke, Ingram gives watching TV as leading to high equanimity. Let me remind you the title of his book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, an unusually hardcore Dharma book. Hardcore, huh? Jeez. This guy is not all there or he's just trying to be facetious again because think about it. He's not, he never did say. If you'd read the book, again, I think this is one of the guys uh, just like the others. Like, why would you critique something you haven't even read? Like, come on, smarten up. It'll only take you a weekend to read it. Smarten up. But, and this is what I would say to this. He wasn't saying that practice is sitting in front of the TV, but I myself, as I've explained before, I never sat. Um, like most do, because I couldn't. Right? I was so tormented between chronic pain and illness and injuries and then trauma and deep, deep emotional and physical scars. 
So for me, I took that off the mat and carried it into everyday life. So for me, I don't read this as a jaded hater. When I hear someone mentions about watching TV leading to high equanimity, I think of something like watching or listening to music or watching a piece of art or a beautiful um, documentary or an excellent piece of journalism or some really touching drama about a human being or anything that touches you. And if you don't understand how that can bring you into in touch with equanimity of all things, then you, I don't think you get what we're all after here, right? And then the final uh, critique for him is he goes on talking about how little time he's uh, he's put into this, but he's been doing this for twenty some years. That critique is again, it's hollow. And finally, there's one lady who just keeps screaming about what a what a um, what, what a individual he is. He, we keep saying I and and me, and the title of his book is Daniel Ingram, uh, R Hat M D. So I'll break that down. Well, he's got to put his name on the book. I think that's a requirement of publishing. Uh, secondly, you want people to know who wrote it. Thirdly, there are people who follow him because. Like I said, I came because he's one of the few that are talking about some of these negative experiences along the path. He's a doctor. He's a doctor. Why wouldn't he put the MD? And I've already explained, the Arhant has uh, there's a, a timestamp in, in uh, the podcast. You can listen to it and have your own opinion. I personally think he's doing it as a troll. He explained that the... Uh, the definition of Arhant has been very fluid uh, throughout history and explained that, you know, he's using it um, as, what would you call that, for effect. He's using it as a, uh, you know, whatever. And so I laugh at that once again, critiquing because, oh, he, he uses the I or the me and the we. When really, if these people had watched the, the podcaster even knew what they were talking about or read the book, they could actually criticize him with reason for the fact that, like I said before, he enjoys doing casino for the pleasure of it. He talks about getting together and, you know, drinking and doing drugs and uh, eating and having fun, which is absolutely fine, right? As long as they really are, you know, you know, doing what makes them happy, essentially, you know that, but you could still actually achieve some insight while doing all that, sure. My point is, don't talk about how he titles his book by his government name and the fact that he uses terms of I and we, and same as people who will go back and say, well, you're so stupid, how else is he supposed to uh, respond to a personal uh, attack uh, without using I or we and... You know, is he, ah, come on, just plain and simple say, it. really, that's what you think is, is the proof that he hasn't um, settled uh, the nature of self when you have a much better example that he's going after supernatural powers and he's indulging in sensual desires, kamachando, right? The first fetter is the nature of self. But here's where you're seeing that these people just don't get it. That's the problem. Because depending on the definition of not just an arhat, not just a stream winner, but if you look at the definitions of fetters, I've just explained this, kamachando, it's not sexual attachment and desire, it's 100% sensual. Any of the, the five senses, even arguably the sixth of the mind. But you're not going to get that commonly. But more importantly... That first fetter is not about subduing the self completely. It's understanding the nature of self, using dependent origination, seeing the emptiness of self. Even Theravadins know this because I did my research and they 100% attribute uh, emptiness to the nature of self and vice versa, right? Because I did this search and I said, it seems weird that these Theravadins will push, push, push to the fourth jhana. Talk about 
residing in equanimity and mindfulness, and yet never once talk about the importance of anicca, an, anatta. Sorry, anicca, the emptiness of self. <laughs> it's all a big freaking... I like when someone said it's like a, a ball of yarn, right? So... It's hilarious. We talk about, oh, well, this person seems to be using I or we, and yet they won't use an actual critique that really has some some weight to it. I, I mean, what is it? Is it a supernatural power of flying and walking through walls? Or is it simply this ability to handle these critiques, like Rudyard Kipling said, right? To hear the truths you've spoken, twisted, by knaves as a trap for fools. Right? And and treat triumph and disaster as the imposters they are. Right? As I explained, oh, I don't think I did. I should do a podcast on Wu Wei. And, uh, someone I respect did a video on Wu Wei. Did an excellent job, except for this understanding that Wu Wei, this concept of going with the flow, is not inaction. It is the idea of unconditioned being. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean you're nothingness. It doesn't mean you don't do nothing. What it means is you don't condition your being with impermanentness. Yourself, labels, preferences, you use that dependent origination and emptiness of self to look at the nature of all things. So once again, even the very heart of these critiques hold no water from that perspective, right? Almost all of the critiques flow from some sort of ego-based threat right i mean for me even i stepped away from uh, daniel's book because um his strong opinion on the the iddi the siddhi the uh, supernatural powers being you know something real actually bothered me as well because uh i well, I mean, I come from a tradition that encourages you to treat these um, treat these teachings um, as flawed. I mean, they're flowing from people. You use logic and reason to suss what makes sense. But at the same time, we've talked about this over and over again. It is remaining constant in that faith. Shraddha. Faith, commitment, and devotion. We've talked about this before. That renunciation and devotion are two sides of a coin. Just like Shamatha and Vipassana. You must remain calm to effectively use insight. To contemplate, you must be calm. Same as... You know, good, calm, deep breaths is a sign of a calm mind. There are two sides to one coin. Just like yin and yang. Black and white. But truly gray. Yin and yang speaks to where one ends, another begins. But nothing is holy itself. It's it truly is.